uh, talking about identity. Last week I ended uh, in Ephesians chapter 5 in verse 1 where it talks about to be imitators of God. And it starts out there if you turn over to Ephesians chapter 1. Amen. Ephesians chapter 5. Did I say Ephesians chapter 1? Yes. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. Um, I started out, I did quite a bit of review last week because it had been a couple of weeks since I was able to get back into the message how I started it, which was in Mark chapter 11, verses 22 and 23. Um, actually, it backs up further than that. It's the story of Jesus cursing the fig tree. And that is a, a prophetic picture of the fig tree as a representation of man hiding from God. Because when Adam and Eve fell and sinned, uh, what sin did is it caused them to run from God and to hide or to cover themselves. They were ashamed. They were ashamed of what they did. And uh, so Jesus cursing the fig tree and to say that there'll be no more fruit thereof, he was prophetically saying that I'm the Messiah and what I'm going to be doing is going to restore your identity so you're not going to have any need of fig leaves. And then it says, uh, there it says that Jesus told him, it says, have faith in God or have the faith of God. Uh, to have the faith of God, you've got to know you are from God. You are of God. And that God has recreated you or created you to be just like him. Yes. You're not him, but he created you to be like him. You're his offspring. There you go. I said, you're his offspring. And then it goes on to say there in Mark eleven twenty three, it says, if you say unto this mountain, and I'll, I'll never forget, that it's just been recent, because I'd heard Mark eleven twenty three 23 and 24 taught ever since I got saved, because I was immediately introduced to the word of faith and Kenneth E. Hagin's ministry and, and the teaching through Rhema and everything. And uh, that's, that was the scriptures that at the age of 16 years of age that Brother Hagin was raised up off the deathbed through a deformed heart and incurable blood disease and paralysis. Uh, that God showed him through that by the Holy Spirit. And you just think about how miraculous that was in and of itself because here you got a 16-year-old boy that was raised Baptist and the Spirit of God is speaking to him and revealing things to him in the Scriptures. Um, so there's purpose. When you've got purpose in your life, God will get through to you and talk to you. But he had, that was his ministry was based so much on those Scriptures. So I'd heard it preached so many times, but just, as of just recent... Uh, as I was studying and reading it and reading it over and reading it over, all of a sudden I saw it. It says in 1123, it says, if you say unto this mountain, and the word this jumped out to me, not a mountain, and, this, and the scripture can be applicable to many things. When you've got a mountain, it's seemingly a mountain in your life, you can speak to it and have it removed. But what the Lord was showing me is that specifically I said, when you speak under this mountain, and the word this jumped off the page at me, and I thought, now wait a minute. We know that we're supposed to read Scripture in its context, so what is the mountain it's talking about? And I realized the Spirit of God showed me it's the mountain of identity. When you don't know who you are in Christ, if you think you're, that you need to be ashamed or you're hiding or, or something in your life about your life or the way you see yourself or the way somebody's talked to you or the way somebody's treated you, and uh, that's the mountain because if you don't know who you are in Christ, nothing else works. Come on. It really, nothing else works. You've got to know who you are in Christ. So then last week we jumped into, and I went to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 1. It says, therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. Therefore, <laughs> be imitators of God. So Paul is telling the Ephesian church here, the church in Ephesus, but he's just as if he's talking to us. How many know that the letters that Paul wrote and, and the, the New Testament uh, was written for us? I said it was written for us. Why? It was written for us, or written to us, I should say. The Old Testament was written for us. The New Testament is written to us. Why? Because we need to know how to live. 
I said, we need to know how to live as New Testament believers. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it says that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The old things are passed away, everything's become new. Well, we need to know what's become new. It's not too hard for any of us, and we should not be so good at it, but it's not too hard for any of us to recognize the old. And maybe that's not a true statement, because if we recognize the old, we would stop functioning in it. Yet many times we function in the old. We do things the way we've always done them. It's kind of like the path of least resistance sometimes. Sometimes uh, we've all heard and understand that uh, we've, many people, we don't like change. Most human beings don't like change. Well, you know what? If you're one of those people that don't like change, it's going to be pretty hard for you to let go of the old. <laughs> we ought to embrace change. Change is the most wonderful thing because Jesus changed us. Where there's nothing about hanging on to the old that we want to hang on to. We should become, in other words, we should become so familiar with the new that it talks about there that we don't even recall the old anymore. But I think we're too good at recalling the old. We're too good many times at recalling the old. And when you recall the old, uh, what will happen is you'll end up gravitating towards the old. You've heard me say many times, it's like with children, my, my wife taught me this because she's done children's ministry since, well, since we were going to church in 1990, and uh, she's just gifted with kids and everything, but just in the natural aspect, the last thing you want to do is tell a child what not to do. <laughs> because the more you, and it's not even children, it's adults. You tell, them, you tell them what not to do, and guess what? They'll eventually do it. Because the, the, the thought is, is, well, I wonder why they don't want me to do that. They might, see, and that's exactly what, what, what Satan did with Adam and Eve. He told him, he says, you know, the, the, God doesn't want you to eat this because, because he knows you'll be just like them. And Eve was just like, well, I wonder what they're holding out on me. When in fact, the, she already was. See, there, there was no identity issue in the beginning. Satan challenged Eve in her identity, and she bit off on it, that there was something more to what she had, and she already had everything. Now, Adam, he had no excuse. <laughs> the enemy didn't deceive him. He went along. Guys, that ought to be a good word for us. We don't just go along. Amen. You may end up in the same boat. But then um, the enemy has always worked that way, challenging the identity. Did it with Jesus, the very Son of God. Jesus gets led out into the wilderness, we know, and when he gets led out there, he's at one of his lowest points because he's been fasting for 40 days. So now, how many know that when you're fa if you fast for 40 days, most of us can't fast for four minutes. <laughs> um, but you fasted for 40 days. Um, how many know that, that your flesh is going to be at a pretty weak point? And, and you're, got, you're hungry. <laughs> and that's when the enemy comes to him. See, many times um, when we're at weak points, that's when the enemy comes. And the first thing the enemy says to him, if you are the Son of God. Now, 40 days earlier, God had just come down, the Spirit of God had just come down like a dove, and a voice came from heaven and says, you are my Son in whom I am well pleased. You are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus, just 40 days earlier, had just heard the voice of his Father telling him, you're my Son, and I am pleased in you. And the enemy comes along and says, uh, if you are the Son of God, Challenges his identity. What he's trying to do is he's trying to get Jesus to do the same thing that, that Eve did, which is abandon his identity and fall for something that is a lie. Well, if the enemy did it to Jesus, where do you think you stand? <laughs> but there's an answer, and that is, is to understand who we are the same way Jesus did. See, Jesus understood who he was. That's why at the age of 12 years old, he's in the temple. 
when, they, when his mom and dad come looking for him, when Joseph and Mary come looking for him, that's where he is as he's in the temple. What's he doing in the temple? He's in there with the Pharisees and the scribes, but he's really, he's in there looking in the scrolls. He's looking in the Word to find himself. He's finding himself in the Bible. He's like, well, there I am, there I am, that, that, yep, yeah, mm-hmm, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, I see that, I see that. See, when we go into the Word of God, it's more than just reading the Word of God. It's finding ourselves. It's finding out who we are in our new identity. And many times when we go into the Word of God, we're going into the Word of God hoping that we're going to get something when we need to be going to the Word of God to see already what we have and who we are. When we get many times when we ask for prayer, we're asking God to do something when it says, when if, if we were open to the Spirit of God and what He was saying and to what the Word of God says, He'd say, you're already that. I can't give you something that I've already given you. It's just like, why, why do you need it a second time? But when you hear what comes out of your mouth or when you hear what comes out of people's mouths, you recognize that that's not what they believe because they're wanting God to do something again. And he can't do it again. And I'm a firm believer that we need to mature to the point is, is that we are confident in who we are so we can begin to do exactly what Ephesians 5, 1 says is now to begin to be imitators, which means now who we are is coming forth from us. That's where God wants us. I said, that's where God wants us. He wants you to be an imitator of him. Well, to be an imitator of him, you've got to go back and see what Jesus did. You've got to look at Jesus' life. That's the greatest, that, that, that's our example. That's the blueprint. And then you look at Paul's life. You look at Peter's life and others, but the greatest blueprint is Jesus' life. If it says that Jesus was tempted in all fashions and all manners, that means everything that we've dealt with or deal with, Jesus dealt with, and he dealt with it. But we pause or hesitate when something comes to us. We pause and hesitate, and we start talking to God about doing something. Jesus knew who he was so much, his reality of who he was in identification is, is he knew that nothing could affect him, so he never entertained it. Sickness had to come along in, when, wherever Jesus was, but he never even entertained it when it came along. We entertain it sometimes. I said, we entertain it sometimes. Before it even hits us, I say, in other words, um, we, this, this is the time of year, man. I, I just spoke with somebody, <laughs> and uh, I do not believe that they're born again. I'm hoping that I have opportunity to bring them closer to the things of God. But I just spoke with somebody that talking about, well, yeah, I just, I just had my flu shot and my COVID shot. Well, COVID is the flu. It is. It's a, it's a form of flu. Come on. It's a form of coronavirus, which is a form of flu. And, and the society has convinced, uh, many in society has been, have been convinced that now they have to have two shots instead of one. Until the word coronavirus came up back in uh, March of 2020, uh, one flu shot a year and you were good. Now you got to get a flu shot and a coronavirus shot. And this is the time of year, so I started off by saying this is just like we need to be really careful um, how what we hear and how it programs us into thinking that we need to function like everybody else functions. And it is. This is the time of year where people start making the comments. Uh, you'll see it on commercials. You'll see it. You walk into a Walgreens or you walk into a Rite Aid or you walk into a CVS pharmacy or you drive, one, drive by one and you see, you know, the, the billboards outside. All kinds of things. But it is basically it's saying this is flu season. This is flu season. So right away, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with this, but I want you to catch what I'm saying here. Right away, what many of us do, and we don't even recognize that we're doing it, we go into emergency faith mode. It's just like, well, bless God, I'm not going to get faith. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to get sick. I'm not going to get sick. No, 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 no. I'm not going to get sick. I'm not going to get sick. Jesus just knew who he was. He was just so confident that he lived a life of faith that he just knew that if anything came along, it just couldn't attach itself to him. But he didn't go into these deep. See, we go into emergency faith mode. 
And I'm not saying there's anything with standing and confessing, you know, yeah, you know what, they just said it's flu season and bless God, I'm not going to get it. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but what I'm saying is how we, uh, there's an element of fear in our confession. <laughs> Ever so slightly, there's an element of fear in our confession. Because it's like, I don't want to get this. So in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, I'm not going to get the flu. And when, in fact, what we do is we really kind of open ourselves up because there's an element of fear there. There's almost an element, and I hate to say it this way, but I know for myself because I kind of function this way at different times in my life. There's almost an element of an expectation that it's going to come. So I'm going to, I'm going to build the wall right now. But that expectation is that it's going to come almost kind of opens you up. So I say there's, I'm, I'm, I want you to hear there's got to be a balance, you know, of your, of your confession and everything. I'm not saying that you just go along blindly, but think about how you respond to certain things when you hear them. And there's a, sometimes there'll be an element of fear in it or an element of doubt um, that we need to be mindful of in our lives and go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute here. And that comes when you become an imitator of God or you understand how Jesus walked. Jesus didn't walk in any level of fear. I think we know that. But he didn't walk in any level of fear. And we don't see him going around confessing things over his own life. Nowhere in the Gospels do we see him going around confessing things over his own life. Why? Because he knew he was the Son of God. He knew who he was. He had flesh just like we had flesh. He was sinless. Well, I know that if I say this, some people are going to, in their own mind, are going to go, oh, wait a minute, you've gone too far here. But guess what? You're sinless. And I can say that because Jesus said that, and the Father said that when, when Jesus shed his blood, he forgave you all sins. So guess what? You're sinless. You say, well, what happens when I sin? You're sinless. <laughs> You've got to bring those two together and realize you're sinless. Why? Because even when you do something that's contrary to the nature of God and your true nature, Jesus paid for it. He paid for it before you did it. So that's why you can say, I'm sinless. Hallelujah. See, and if you recognize you're sinless and you're in that level of relationship with the Father and to the Father, now you can begin to walk like Jesus walked. See, Jesus' sinless walk on the earth is now your sinless walk. <laughs> because everything that God wanted to do in humanity, he did in Jesus and put it to your account. So if Jesus walked sinless and Jesus took care of the sin issue, guess what? You're sinless. Now, I know people will argue with you, and you may even have an argument in your own mind going, yeah, but you don't understand. I sin once in a while. No, you don't sin. It gets real quiet when you say things like that. See, it goes back to one of the simplest teachings, spirit, soul, and body. The Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians that we're spirit, we have a soul, and we live in a body. The real you, said the real you is the spirit of man. You're not your body. So if your flesh does something because you don't have any control over it, you don't have dominion over it, that doesn't mean that you're a sinner. It just means that you bowed your knee to your carnality or to your soul and your thoughts. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> doesn't get much simpler, does it? Don't do that. But this is really more simple than we think. We work and we try so hard at doing certain things and at becoming a certain way. And you got to begin to understand it's who you are. It's who you are. Jesus said over in John chapter 14, I'm going to come back to Ephesians, but in John chapter 14, verses 8 and 9, Philip says to Peter, he says, show us the Father. And Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So if we're going to be imitators of God, 
Our lives need to be so meshed with and one with that you can't tell where Jesus begins and where we begin, or, and it's unity. There's such a level of unity. So when P, if we have, and we may receive or hear similar responses, um, well, show me Jesus. Well, we ought to be able to look at them and just say, you know what, if you've seen me, you've seen Jesus. Or if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Now, I heard one preacher make a saying, and I, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer in this, this is my opinion, but when Jesus made that statement, Jesus was the Son of God, but He was also a Son of God because He said, I'm the first of many. So, which means there's more sons and daughters coming, and that's us. So, when Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, we can say, if you've seen me, we've seen the Father. They've seen the Father. Um, our objective should be not to be imitators necessarily of just Jesus or our big brother because we weren't born of him. We were born of our father. I said, we weren't born of Jesus. We were born of our father. What Jesus did made it possible for us to be born of our father. It wasn't to be born of him. We can't go around and say, well, I'm born of Jesus because that would be contrary to what the Scripture says. Jesus Himself said, you need to be born from above. You need to be born of your Father. So we can honestly say the same thing Jesus said, but I heard one preacher say one time, it's just like, Jesus, He quoted the Scripture that, uh, you know, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, then we should be able to go around and say, if you've seen me, you've seen Jesus. And I'm a firm believer that it's, uh, there's almost a level of, I don't dare make the statement, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, because that's going a little bit too far. But if we're born of our Father, that's who we ought to resemble. I mean, anybody that's ever come to me, when my, when my Father was still alive, my natural Father, nobody ever came up to me as we're talking about, and they'd go, oh, wow, you resemble your brother. They always said, you look just like your dad. They never said, oh, you look like your brother. Matter of fact, they'd make some statements sometimes and they'd say, you look just like your dad and your brother, he looks a little bit like your mom, but he looks like your dad too. But they never compared my, that I looked like my brother. They always said I look like my dad. So we got to be that bold. We look like our dad. We look like our dad in appearance. You say, well, how do you know what the father looks like? You need to understand, spiritually speaking, we appear just like the father appeared through Jesus. <laughs> The way the Father put Himself on display through Jesus is the way the Father will put Himself on display through us. But we're so, we're, we're way too caught up into trying to be something yet. You say, well, no, I'm really not. It's just like, yeah. Because when we come to the Father, or we come and talk to Jesus, and we really are supposed to be talking to the Father, not to Jesus. Jesus made that real clear. Yes, the Father. That's a, uh, that's a whole other teaching I don't want to get into right now, is about who are we talking to. We come to the Father in Jesus' name, which means that authority that Jesus gave us now gives us the same authority to talk to the Father like He talked to the Father. That's the purpose of Jesus, and that's the purpose of the name. Amen. But we've been taught correctly, I can say, but yet almost wrong, is we've been taught the side of the unbeliever, because if you're born again, you're a believer. Say, I'm a believer. I'm a believer. If you're born again, you're a believer. If you've put your trust in the Son of God, that means the whole package. Sometimes I get that sometimes we need to know what the package all consists of, so there is a, a level of knowing that, but once you know what the, what the package consists of, once you see all the points and the parts that are in the benefit package, if I can say that way, um, you don't have to go, I mean, 
I've used this analogy. I'll use it again. When you go and, and get a job somewhere, you apply for a job, and they say, you know, we'd like to hire you. And they say, okay, well, what, what's, what does the job all consist of? What's the benefit package? And they'll sit down and they'll tell you, well, you know, you get X number of days or weeks in vacation, and you get X number of sick days, and you get X number of benevolent days, and you get X number of holidays, and you get this insurance, and you get that insurance. And they'll tell you your benefit package. You know, we, we might provide a phone for you. We'll provide a company car for you. You know, we'll do this. We'll pay for your gas. Uh, da, 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 you, you can go on the list depending on the job and who you're working for. Once you find out the benefit package and you know it's yours, would, does it seem right or do you ever go, well, I wonder if I get vacation, after you've worked there six months, I wonder if I get vacation. Yet they told you when you took the job, you got vacation. And now six months in, a year in, a year and a half in, you're like, I wonder if I get vacation. I don't know if I get vacation. I better go to HR and ask them if I get vacation. And then if I get vacation, I wonder, is there anything I need to do to partake of this vacation? I just, no. And that's kind of the way we've been taught in the body of Christ is that we're constantly coming to the Father as an unbeliever. All, all of the accounts in the Gospels, which are true. But I believe the accounts of the Gospels, that once you become the believer, now you've switched from the side of coming to Jesus to do something for you. Now I'm a believer. Now guess what? I'm on the side of Jesus. People are coming to me like people came to Jesus. But if we don't think we're Jesus yet, if we don't think we have what it takes, if we don't know what the benefit package is, every time something tries to come at us, the enemy pulls us a quick one, uh, an end run on us, you know, a sneak attack or whatever to try to get us to look at, wow, look what's happening. Then all of a sudden, we go from being when everything is going right, from believer to I got to come to Jesus now because I need something. Well, you just went from a believer to an unbeliever. Now, can you see where when it talks about the Scripture, not be double-minded? We actually live too, we, we have lived too long as believer slash unbeliever. We're believer when everything is going right because we're like, hallelujah, I'm a child of God. Look at this. And then something with financial, physical, mental, relational, whatever, something comes, and now we're going to Jesus in prayer. It's just like, oh, help me here. Now I'm saying all this to say that our identity, developing in our identity, we're to be imitators of Christ. Imitators. Remember I shared last week, imitators means to follow as a pattern, model, or example. So if the Bible tells us in Ephesians 5, it says, therefore, be imitators of God. It doesn't say be imitators of Jesus. It says be imitators of God, big G, meaning be imitators of your Father. But you are being an imitator of Jesus because Jim, Jesus imitated his father. So you can put it together, and, and it is the same thing. And Jesus is the greatest picture that we see. He, he's, a, he's an example, the first, to show this is how you imitate your father. That's what Jesus was basically saying. He says, there is a day, that it's not going to be long in my ministry here, where I'm going to set everything right to where now you're going to be child of God. Just like I'm a, you're going to be a son or a daughter of God. So I'm going to show you his three years of ministry was to show us this is how you imitate your father. I'm imitating my father right now. Three years of ministry, Jesus said, I'm imitating my father. I'm going to show you how a son operates. I'm going to show you how a daughter operates. I'm going to show you how to imitate your father. And then when I leave, I'm going to send the Holy Ghost to live on the inside of you so that now you can imitate your father. Now we need to ask ourselves, are we imitating our father? 
Are we imitating our Father? Which means you can ask yourself, are you doing, uh, do you look like Jesus? Because Jesus looked like his Father. You really can't separate the two, so I don't want to be talking about, you know, what I, what I was saying earlier about, you know, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Well, if Jesus functioned so much like his Father, I mean, there was no, you couldn't tell the difference. You couldn't tell the difference. That's why identity is so huge. I, was, I even looked up the definition of identity or identical. Similar in every detail, exactly alike. So can you see the value of our identity? We're to be identical to our Father, meaning we are to be similar in every detail, exactly alike. <laughs> Having such close resemblance as to being essentially the same. We've all seen identical twins. It's astounding how close identical twins are. Like, there can be twins... And then there's identical twins. There's paternal twins born at the same time, come out of the same womb, same time, but they don't have. But then there's identical twins, and it's just like there's, there's certain identical twins that are even more identical than identical twins. <laughs> They're so close, just like. Matter of fact, I, I've seen some, uh, there's no doubt they could fool me. If the one walked in and said, well, I'm so-and-so, it's just like, yeah, you are. <laughs> well, you think about that. In a natural arena, how much more than like our Father? Somebody could walk in and they go, wow, you look just like Jesus. You look just like your heavenly Father. <laughs> and it's not by appearance, it's by how you respond. It's by your lifestyle. It's by the clothes you put on. Remember, I started this message off by saying the title of the message was being a put on. We need to be such a put on that we put on Christ. Amen? I said we put on Christ. Now, I said last week, I've already said a lot and didn't get much further than, a, than what I had gotten last week. But in Ephesians chapter 5, it says, therefore be imitators. So we've got to find out what's it there for. So we've got to back up. Let's go into chapter 4. Therefore be imitators. In the New King James, we'll start reading just for the sake of time, in verse 17. Verse 17. Verse 17 says, This I say, therefore, in testifying the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. So here Paul's saying that we're not to walk like the rest of the Gentiles walk. Which means there's something that has changed in you. Paul is making a, a very distinct thing here. He's not just saying, don't walk like that. He's saying something's changed in your life. So you shouldn't be walking like that. But if you don't know something's changed, you're going you're gonna to walk the same way. See, we will continue to do the same things we've always done if we don't know there's a new way of doing it. That's why many of us do some of the things that we do is because we were raised a certain way. And it's just become so comfortable and so familiar that, you know what? It's just the way I do it. But Paul is saying here, don't do that. <laughs> He's saying there's something new that's happened. And you can get that if you back all the way up in its full context is reading the whole letter. Uh, Paul talks about back in Ephesians chapter 2 that we were crucified with Christ. Paul talks about that uh, we're his workmanship created for good works. So it's almost when we've heard the things about the potter and the clay, God changed things when we got born again. We're no longer the same uh, lump of clay. When we came to God, we were just a lump. Now that we've come into God, we're a vessel unto honor, a vessel to be used. 
So it goes here on to say, it says, This I say, therefore, in testifying the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. Now, Paul's saying, I think this is interesting. Paul is saying, don't walk like that anymore, which indicates that even being a believer, you can still walk like that. <laughs> we don't want to walk like that anymore. Paul's saying, don't. Well, how do you do that? Well, we know according to Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, it says renew our mind. But to renew our mind, the Bible says first, is you've got to present yourself a living sacrifice, yeah. which means you've got to say, I'm not going to do things the way I've always done it. Flesh, you don't get to say it anymore. I'm turning you over to be sacrificed, and I'm going to start doing it a new way. But you've got to find out what the new way is. That's part of the renewing of the mind, is you're, you're, you're renewing yourself to doing things different, new patterns, new habits, new way of doing things. When we get born again, we ought to just wake up, you know, and just say, you know what? There's a new sheriff in town. And it's not the old crucified man. There's a new sheriff in town. It's just like if you're used to when you went, that because of the, I was talking about this is the season. And I understand that sometimes, you know, attacks come and no harm, no foul. You just understand that Jesus paid the price and you walk through that and get on the other side of it. Amen. But if you do succumb to it some, it's just like, don't do what you've always done, which means don't crawl into bed for three days and take your NyQuil or whatever else you may do. Just say, you know what, I'm not going to do that this time. Because if I really believe that I am the healed, then what do healed people do? Well, healed people get up, live life. They don't crawl into bed for three days or four days. Amen. Amen. You act like you're healed. You say, well, that sounds pretty foolish. It's like, no, it doesn't. That's faith. Faith sees the unseen. You say, when you're, when you're catering to what, to what your body's telling you or your finances, it can be in your, with your finances, when you're catering to that, you're actually looking at the scene and, and you're responding to the scene realm. And you're not responding to the unseen realm. We need to respond to the see unseen realm, not to the seen realm. And the seen realm is the, cell, is the realm of sensuality or the senses. And you've heard me say it so many times. That is many times what speaks to us more than anything. That's why our walk of faith is hindered or, if I can say, weak, is because we're allowing the seen realm, those things that we see or are sensing in this arena, the five physical sense realm, we're allowing those things to tell us what truth is. When in fact, that's a lie because Jesus changed all that. He's not going to change it. He changed it. So when you've got a sniffle, you can either buy, and I'll say it this way because it's the truth, you can buy into the lie of the sniffle or you can buy into the truth of the healed. You say, well, how do you know if I'm doing that? Well, what does the sniffle tell you to do? Walk around with a box of Kleenexes, make sure you have your nasal spray, uh, take your NyQuil, take your Alka-Seltzer Plus, you know, whatever, whatever you were raised in doing. Come on. Are you saying there's anything wrong in, in taking a Kleenex and having to blow my nose? No, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. They don't run something into the ditch. I mean, dear Lord, I don't want you walking around in public with a big old booger hanging down. Because <laughs> it's like, oh, I ain't got boogers. Yeah. <laughs> you can see how easy it is people run things into the ditch. It's just like, Brother Hagin used to say that all the time. It's either they're on this side or they're on this side. Brother Hagin said, we've got to get in the middle of the road. We've got to get in the middle of the road. Let me, let me close this up quick here, and we'll go pick it up next week again. Verse 19, uh, I stopped reading in verse 18. Uh, because of the blindness of their hearts, he says, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanliness with greediness, but you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, 
which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. It says, and that you put on the new man. You put on the new man. Notice, you don't put the new man on by working real hard at putting the old man off. See, this is the whole picture of Galatians and walking in the Spirit. It's Paul's saying the same thing here. He's just saying it in a different way. You don't put on the new man, or you don't put off the old man. I don't know what I'm trying to say here. <laughs> I had it, and then I lost it. But what I'm saying is, is you, all you focus on is putting on the new man. When you put the new man on, the old man just gets removed. Yeah. We don't focus on trying to put the old man off. That's what I was trying to say. We put too much focus on what we're trying to get rid of. It's just like, when in fact, if you're focused on what you're trying to get rid of, you think you still have it. You think you're still the old nature. You think you're still the old man. Corinthians says old things have passed away. If they passed away, you've heard me say this many times, but when someone dies in the natural, what do we say? Oh, so-and-so passed away. Well, if the old man is passed away, if the old nature is passed away, it doesn't exist. It's dead. But if we work real hard at trying to put it off, in essence, in other words, we're saying it's still alive. I got to do something with it which means we now do not recall or remember or believe that Jesus crucified it. Jesus said, I crucified the flesh. You were crucified. Paul, Paul said, you were crucified. I was crucified with Christ. <laughs> so you can see the danger of working so hard at, I just got to stop doing this. I just got to stop doing this. I just got to stop doing this. One is every time you say that, every time you work so hard at it, you're giving the very thing that you are no longer, you're giving it strength to be you're giving it strength to be. The Bible says we're to all acknowledge every good thing. <laughs> we're not supposed to acknowledge the bad things. Philemon 6, that the working of our faith through the acknowledging of every good thing. So what means is to put on Christ means is you have to know who you are. You have to know what Christ has done. You have to know what Jesus did. You have to begin to look at his life. You've got to begin to look at Paul's life. That's why the letters of Paul are so important. That's why the New Testament speaks to, is written for us. It's written directly to us. Because it's just like, you've got to know who you are. And when you begin to know who you are, that's what you put on. You don't go, no, wait a minute, before I put that on, I need to go take this off and, and take a shower and get cleaned up because I don't want to put clean clothes on a dirty body. But in fact, when you come to Christ, he cleaned you up. You're already set to put on clean clothes. You're already set to put on your righteousness. You're already set to put on your healing. You're already set. Jesus dealt with that issue. So we don't need to put anything off in a sense of working. At, I got to take this off. I got to take this off. And many times, unfortunately, what we do is we, we work hard at trying to take off the things that we're not. And we really don't want to get rid of them. So we take the things that are not. We want to put them in the washing machine and wash them and see if we can put them back on. Because maybe we could make it look good again. It's like, you ain't never going to make it look good. <laughs> Amen. You're never going to make it look good. <laughs> once, once it was taken off at Christ and you opened your life up to him and you come to him and you say, I'm not picking that back up ever again. Those are dirty clothes, man. And no matter what you do, you're never going to get them clean. You're never going to get them clean. I don't care what you do with them. I don't care how many times you wash them. I don't care how many times you confess them. I don't care how many times you speak the word over them. I don't care how many times. You, they're always going to look the same way they looked. And now they even have the stench of death because they've been crucified. And you're never going to get rid of that stench. You put them back on, it's going to be like, what is that smell? <laughs> it 
So to put on Christ simply means that you begin to know who you are. That's why when you jump into verse, chapter 5, verse 1, it says, therefore. Once you understand and you understand what you've been clothed in, because Jesus clothed you. He put a new robe on you. And that robe is righteousness. And within that robe of righteousness is everything that God intended for us to be. He did in Christ everything that he wanted us to be. So you've got to know who you are. And Christ comes to live on the inside of you. So, you know, it's not that hard. <laughs> but we're, we're always out here reaching. Coming to God as the unbeliever. That's the way we've been taught, even with the Gospels, that we're coming to God. And yes, we can look at those examples in the Gospels. They're beneficial, but we need to understand that if you're born again, you're not the woman with the issue of blood coming for healing. If you're born again, you're already healed. You're not the paralytic man that's being let down through the roof coming to Jesus for healing. You're already the whole and the healed. You're not the man with the weathered hand that needs to come into Jesus and hoping that you get a word. We need to do a paradigm shift in our thinking. Those, those accounts are very valuable because those that are not believers need to know that if they come to Christ, they can become a believer and not have to deal with that anymore. But it's been taught so much that we're believers and we're still coming to God as unbelievers. I mean, how many times have we heard those stories, heard those accounts, and then we even, if something's not working right, we think, well, I guess I just, I guess I just don't believe. Well, in one essence, you don't believe. What you don't believe is you don't believe that you're the child of God that he says you are. That's what you don't believe. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Verse 24 there says again, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God put on the new man that was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. That's what you put on, and you start by simply, and really, the thing is, is you do that by simply acknowledging Christ and the work of Christ, what Jesus did. And then I do understand, I'll just close with saying this, if you don't know the full benefit package, that's understandable. Because none of us come into the Word of God when we're born again and know everything that's in the benefit package. But as you begin to, you add that to your list of what you believe. Part of being a believer. It's just like, oh, well, I see that's, my, that's in the benefit package. That's mine. I don't need to go asking for it anymore. I've already been told I have it. <laughs> it's like if you don't know what's in the benefit package, then you have to go to the Father and just say, hey, is this mine? But once you know you got it, you don't have to go back to him and ask if you've got it. You don't have to ask him for it. You just need to partake of it. Amen? Glory to God. Glory to God. I said,